before this election, it seemed like the major issue that intellectuals, politicians were talking about was this question in inequality, uh, the gap between rich people and poor people, the gap between the middle class and the poor, the rich and the middle class, all kinds of gaps that they come up with. And that was the main problem in our society. And indeed, every other problem that we face seemed to be blamed on inequality, including, for example, terrorism in the Middle East, right? Syria was a consequence of inequality, we were told. And the Pope talked about this, and he said it was the most important issue of our time. And President Obama said it over and over and over again. And Elizabeth Warren talks about it constantly. And this, in terms of the intellectuals on the left, there is no issue that's, that they use more in order to try to frame the discussion today than this question of inequality. It keeps coming back over and over again. And they try to explain, as I said, try to explain everything using it. But they try to say it's a real problem for a variety of different reasons. There are a lot of economic reasons, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today. But they try to say inequality is destroying our economy. We don't have economic growth because of it. Uh, inequality is, uh, is the cause, not the consequence of, but the cause of cronyism. It's the cause of all these uh, phenomena. Now, I'm just going to say from an economic perspective, because I don't want to talk about the economics issues tonight, there just isn't anything there. There's no there there. There's no economic issue with inequality. There just isn't. There's no economic theory that explains, that has anything to do with inequality qua inequality, that relates it to economic growth, or relates it to levels of poverty, or relates it to any economic phenomena. Okay. So I want to put that kind of aside. Because I think there's a deeper, more important issue that relates to the whole inequality discussion that they're really trying to get at. And they use economics as an excuse because people care, right? We care about economics. We care about our standard of living. We care about how well, our f about our future, how well we can do in the future. And if people tell us this inequality thing, it's going to limit your opportunities in the future. Because of inequality, you're going to be poorer in the future. People get excited about that. That riles people up. Right? But what's, what's really going on here? And there, there are a couple of assumptions that they make that are related to economics but are not, not really economics. And the fundamental is, I think the fundamental in po politics, if you will, is that the fundamental idea behind the idea of, of, of the, behind the emphasis on equality, the making this a big issue, this idea of you should care about how rich the rich are and how poor the poor are and where the middle class and about all this stuff is fundamentally the idea of collectivism, right? And think about it. If collectivism is right, and collectivism I mean that we place the group above the individual, that the standard, the standard in morality, in politics, in everything that we think is the good of the group. It's the good of the collective. It's the value to the collective, right? And that indeed values are produced not by individuals, but by a collective, then suddenly we care, right? We care about the fact that some people have more Y, because that means that we all produce stuff, and some people get a bigger slice of what we all produced. Because the perspective is, we all did it. We all created it. It's a big pie, right, that we bake together and now is being divvied up based on, who knows, you know, political poll, cronyism, based on inheritance, based on, we don't know. But it just doesn't seem fair because it's we made this pie, therefore we should all pe get a piece of it. So at the heart of this politically is this idea of the group creates, the group builds, the group makes which is very anti-American, which is very hard for Americans to absorb. Now, I know there's some non-Americans here. Europeans have a much easier way of this. They, you know, America was built on the idea that we're individuals, that the standard is our individual life, our individual happiness. 
each individual makes and creates. Right? I like to say, there's no collective pie. Each one of us makes a, a pie, right? And we can, as economists, aggregate all those numbers up and say there's social wealth, but there's no such thing. There's just your wealth and your wealth and your wealth and your pie and your pie and your pie. And we can squish all the pies together, but it's still somebody baked those pies. So individuals bake the pie. And that's the perspective that Americans have always had. That perspective of, I did it. You did it. Right. That's always been the standard. So the left has had a hard time with this inequality issue because Americans don't buy into this collectivistic standard of value, this, the group produced, the group created. So how do we undercut the American sense of individualism? How do we undercut the American sense of you bake the pie? Well, Obama told us, right? Obama, I, I mean, my favorite, in quotes, speech of Obama's is the, anybody know? Yeah, you didn't build that speech, right? The you didn't build that speech. Obama says very explicitly, and this is based on a speech or a paper that Elizabeth Warren had written months before, and it's based, we'll see, philosophically where. But it's the idea that you didn't build it. Individuals don't build anything. They're dependent on, and they get help from the group. And you can fill in the blank for the group, right? They're dependent on their teachers and the roads and the government that did X and the government that did Y. You're not alone. And of course, there's a sense in which that's true. That's why it gains credibility. It's why he can get away with it. Because there's a sense in which, yeah, we had great teachers. That's cool. Right? But the idea, is that he, the idea is that you are not responsible for what you build, what you create, what you make. It's all these other people's influence on you, all these other people's shaping of you. Shaping on the environment in which you build and create and make this stuff that made it possible for you to contribute a little bit, right? And it's to contribute, right? To contribute to the social pie. It's not making anything for yourself. It's contributing. Right? That's the terminology of collectivism. You don't count. It's what you do for the group that counts. So think about it. So what you are... Obama's telling us, and Elizabeth Warren's telling us, is not you, it's what other people have shaped you into being. What you create is not created by you, but was created together, but in a, in, not in a sense of trade, but in a sense of deep dependency by a group of people. You as an individual don't count. You count only as a unit within the group. And now if you go deeper into that, right, what's at the heart of this notion? What are they trying to convince us when they say you are shaped by your teachers and by your environment or by other people? What are they rejecting? Yeah, they're rejecting your shaping of your own life. They're rejecting your own choices that you make. They're rejecting your own free will. Right? Now, they're rejecting a lot of other things at the same time. Right? The idea of trade. Right? I mean, because you could take any one of those elements, uh, you know, who builds the roads, and you know, Bill Gates didn't do it alone, he did it with employees, but what they're rejecting is the trade. Right? But what's a trade? What's, a, what's at the core of a trade? What's at the core of the relationship between a, in a trade? What are we doing? You know, we're exchanging values. We're making choices about our own lives. We're making choices for ourselves and choosing to engage in a transaction. Emphasis on choosing. Right? But they want us to start doubting those choices. Not the, what choices we make, but the very fact that we make choices. Do we make choices? If we're really shaped by our teachers, if we're really shaped by our parents, if we're really shaped by our environment, then are we making any choices? Are we not just automatons determined by the group, by 
the collective. And if we are just automatons determined by the group, by the collective, then is anything we make ours? Is it anything, is, does belong, does property, does rights, does my sly, my baking a pie mean anything? When, no, it was the fact that you had really good parents and they invested in you. And you had, you, you, you had a good teacher and I had a lousy teacher. So you, you got to build something and make something of yourself and I didn't. But that's only because you had a particular influence and I didn't have that. And what we don't get at all what we don't get at all in the debate is what did I do with whatever environment I had, right? So they make a big deal out of the environmental influences each one of us experiences and how that shapes us and makes us. And again, there's an element of truth to it. If you had a great teacher, that might have opened doors that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So it's that element of truth that makes what they say convincing to so many. It's not, you can't just reject everything they say. You didn't build that, oh, that's stupid, as many conservatives do. That's just stupid, right? Because there's a sense in which, yeah. But you have to dig deeper. You have to think about, okay, there were a lot of kids who had the great teacher. Some kids let that open a door for them, and other kids didn't do anything with that fact that there was a great teacher. So we're all shaped by our environment, we are told. And therefore, the environment is other people, and therefore other people deserve as much or a significant amount of what we create as we do. But that's not deep enough. That's not good enough, right? Because it's, everybody knows it's not just an environment that shapes us, right? What else shapes us? Uh, genetics, right? We're not just shaped by environment, we are told. We're also clearly shaped by our genes. And, and you know, Obama doesn't quite say this, but, but somebody else does. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett talks about this quite a bit. I don't know if you know Warren Buffett, second richest man in America. Warren Buffett says, right, I'm just lucky. I was born with the right genes in the right time. He says, and he's right, right? The genes that he was born with, let's assume the talents and skills that he was born with, would not have been useful if he had been born in the 15th century. So he says, I was lucky twice. I got the right genes in the right century. And then I had loving parents, and I had great teachers, and I have all these other people. So what's the conclusion of that? Right? If I had all this, if I had great genes, great timing, great parents, great teachers, help from everybody else, then I, what's the, what's, the, what's the status of the pie that I created, of all the wealth that I've built? Is it mine? Is it? Not really, right? It's other people's. And some of it's, I can't really, even though it's mine, I can't really take credit for it because I just had good genes, by chance, by luck. And I can't really take credit for luck. Luck is just arbitrary. So Buffett says, well, sometimes he says, sometimes he contradicts himself, but that, that doesn't seem to bother him very much. He says, I don't deserve this. You know, I don't deserve it. He, he, I mean, I haven't seen him giving it all away. Um, until he dies, which is convenient. But <laughs> he explicitly says that there's no real dessert here. Right? There's no real dessert here. I don't really deserve it because it's all a function of luck and influences external. Right? And it's fascinating to me in the, all these discussions, uh, these discussions that are not being done by philosophers or super intellectuals, politicians, and business leaders, and that they're all making these assumptions about what shapes themselves and what shapes all of us. All of them assume that we are being shaped by our environment, or our genes, or if you're really radical, if you're really cutting edge, right, some or both, 
But that's it. And I often talk to audiences, and I say, OK, environment, genes, some or both. Is there something missing? And almost, yeah, this group, I assume, would know. <laughs> but in almost, in a lot of cases, you get complete silence. People don't think about that there's an alternative, even though implicitly they kind of assume it, but they don't think it. And it's, it's, it's almost intellectually not cool to think that we actually have free will, that we actually are responsible for the choices that we make, that we actually choose what to do with what the environment actually provides us, the good teacher, the bad teacher, what we do with the genes that we actually have. That it's our choices, our decisions, our free will that actually is shaping what we do. That it's not. I mean, luck is there, but it's what you do with the luck and how you create your own luck because you make the right kind of choices. That is almost unheard of in the world in which we live today. I mean, people might say, yeah, yeah, no, I did build that. But they don't go any deeper than that. And the attack is clearly an attack on the very notion of individual free will. Now think about it again in reverse. If you attack, if we attack free will, if you are not responsible for what you do, then the stuff that you create, is that yours? In what sense? What does it mean to talk about yours? if you're not actually the agent creating it, building it, making it. And if it's not yours, then it's easy to take it away from you. It's easy to justify taking it away from you. Right? It's easy to say, well, there's the collective pie, and you got a bigger slice, so we're going to trim away a little bit of those slices. Okay. So. Many of these political issues, and we'll talk about this during the conference quite a bit, many of these political issues really come out of whether, of, of a perception of whether there is free will or not, and then what is the nature of that free will. And you'll hear a lot, particularly tomorrow morning from Ankar Gatte about the objectivist theory, about Ayn Rand's theory of what free will is. You'll hear later about, you know, the more, much more detail about, about both the philosophical, the psychological, the scientific, basis for the idea of free will. What I want to just indicate today, and we'll talk about this again tomorrow, is that these questions are not just theoretical, philosophical musings. They're not just fun things that we get to talk about with our pals hours and hours and hours late at night, which I think some of you have probably had those discussions, right? right? about, particularly free will is a good one, right? Because people love debating it and discussing it and getting into it and prove it and show it and so on. These have real world consequences. Real world consequences, again, we'll discuss tomorrow. We'll talk about immigration and foreign policy and one other one I forget. Free speech and free speech, right? All, but it really affects every policy issue. Because your perspective of free will will determine, to a large extent, your perspective on the question of individualism versus collectivism. Your perspective on whether there is such a thing as individual rights or not. Do rights really have meaning? Ask Ankar or Greg this. Do rights really have meaning if there's no free will? If we're just deterministic? I think the answer is no. It doesn't mean anything to say you have a right to your life if there's just a deterministic world out there. So all the policy decisions that we hear today, all the economic decisions, discussions that we hear out there, ultimately are shaped by very basic philosophical assumptions. Basic philosophical assumptions that, that Ayn Rand had a unique perspective on. So obviously Ayn Rand is an advocate for free will. And free will is at the base of both a moral system and as a consequence of that at the base of a political system. You do control your own life. 
You control your own life because you control your own mind. Because you are thinking being and you get to choose. The fundamental choice that you make is to think or not to think, to focus your mind or not to focus your mind. And if you choose to think, your experiences with the teacher, your experiences with your parents, your experiences with poverty, your experiences with wealth, whatever environment you grew up, are going to be different than if you choose not to think. So you, at the end of the day, are responsible for what you do with whatever environment you have. And you, at the end of the day, are responsible for what you do with whatever the, I, know, I hate to call it a genetic lottery because that's their terminology, with the genes that you have, right? We all have different genes. Look around the room. We're all different, right? We're all different, which is cool, right? It's actually really cool, right? Imagine if everybody was the same. Even if they were all like me, <laughs> it would be terrible and it would be boring, right? So to try to condition people to collectivism, the left, primarily the left, is trying to undercut the idea of free will. Now, whether they're doing it for that reason, I mean, that could be debated. They, they might first believe there's no free will and they come up with collectivism as a result. It depends on which direction you're going, and it's going in both directions, of course. Uh, we want, they want, us to view everything in terms of groups, everything in terms of collectives. You're seeing that on the right as well. Uh, you're seeing more and more of that on the right, the idea that the group, your group identity is what matters, not who you are as an individual. And we need, a, we need to fight this, we need to combat this, or at least we need to have good answers when these issues come up. And we need to have solid philosophical answers. And I mean, I think this is, I, I think free will is a relatively easy one, right? How do we know we have free will? What's that? You chose to come here. Uh, you, were, you were guided by, by your environment. You were destined to come here from when you were <laughs> two years old. Thanks to Jennifer. Now this Jennifer. Now Jennifer. <laughs> How do we know we have free will? The same way, yeah. We have the element of choice. How do you know you have the element of choice? How do you know it? What's that? Reason, rational thinking. No. How do you know? How do you know? How do I know this podium exists right here and it has this shape? Is it because of my rational thinking? What's that? Because I see it. How do you know you have free will? Because you can see it, not with your eyes, but you can introspect and observe yourself choosing. You can observe yourself thinking. You can observe yourself not thinking, drifting. You can observe yourself waking up and switching it on. It's an observational thing. You can't, I mean, you can't reason yourself into it. Just like, like you know, <laughs> I don't even know what to do with the podium at this point, right? How do you reason yourself into a podium? I'm sure Kant would have a good explanation. But, um, <laughs> right? So, but it's exactly, it's exactly the doubt in your own observation about yourself, the doubt even in our own observations in terms of sensual data, in terms of seeing and thinking and read and, and, and touching, right? It's the doubt that they've instilled, that many philosophers have instilled in us that makes us question these things. And these things have vast consequences in almost everything that we do in life, and certainly in every one of these political decisions. So the right way to think about the inequality question is to start with the question of did you build it? And Obama's right. That is the key question. The key question about in, you know, in political society is are you responsible for your own actions? Can you be judged? And if you create something, is it you creating it? And if it is, then it's yours. Then you get to own it. 
then nobody can take it away from you. Then who cares about inequality? It's not a grand, big pie. There is no pie. I hate that metaphor. There is no pie. Right? Each one of us does our thing. Each one of us creates our own values. There's no all the value that J.K. Rawlins created and all the value that you created and we put it all together and it's somehow some, something combined. Well, Bill Gates, so and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and everybody in this room and everybody out there and we all throw it in together. That doesn't exist. We must look at things from an individualistic perspective, from the individual. And if you create it, if you build it, if you bake it, if you make it, you get to decide what's done with it. It's yours. It's nobody else's. So the whole point here is to defend, to defend the idea that each one of us does build it. And to do that, we have to have a solid foundation of free will. And that's what we're going to be talking about the rest of the conference. So with that, I'll take questions. Thanks. We have a mic here, I guess. We got a mic here. We'd like you to use the mic. Sorry. And there's a mic over there, so there's one close to you. Thank you. Hi, sure. I'm Joshua Glosson hey, from Joshua. Uh, Pasadena, California. Um, you made a statement that, uh, that uh, all of our judgments are based on axiomatic perceptions and that uh, based on what we see is what we know is what's real. And so what I'm asking you is, uh, when I said that reason was the way that we determine what's real and what's not real, uh, magic is a great example of that. Um, we think we see certain things and we see certain uh, things happening and we swear to ourselves that those are the things that are happening, yet those are not what are happening. I think that objective value actually determines that whether or not we believe what's happening or what's not uh, happening, it, it, it doesn't matter, that, that it is what it is, uh, that, uh, that uh, necessity uh, is, is key in this, in this, in, in, in this instance. Uh, so what you said was that what we see is what determines what's real. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily true, and I want you to explain a little bit more so on it that. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean we're infallible in terms, of, in terms of making mistakes. But at the end of the day, what we see is what is real. So, you know, I might make a mistake about this podium because I've, I've seen it in an angle the way it looks like a table, and I say it's a table and it turns out to be a podium. But it ultimately, it's sens it sense evidence that will suggest to me that it's something different. Right? And that, all I'm saying is that that's the level at which we experience our own free will. That is, it is a, it is a, it is, it's, it's in the same category. So I'm not saying that any, every time you see something, you're seeing it right. But I would suggest you ask the philosophers that question uh, tomorrow. You'll have lots of opportunity, because I'm sure I'm screwing it up, yeah. So I think we can all agree that um, the idea of free will is absolutely necessary for the premises of objectivism to work, but I don't see how that proves that um, free will is true. Just because we want free will to be true in order for objectivism to, to work, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. And the idea of, the idea of consciousness, is, which is what you're saying, how we see us making the choice, yeah. just because we're conscious of us making the choice doesn't necessarily mean that we're freely making those choices. So your first statement is absolutely right, right? You, you, you don't, just because we need, uh, need free will to be right in order to be individualists and, and objectivists doesn't make it right. Uh, my purpose is not to try to prove free will right now. So leave all those questions for, for Hong Kong, Greg. Sorry. <laughs> That's it? All right. Everybody's now worried about what kind of questions they can ask. <laughs> well, hopefully it'll be a good one. Uh, my name is Chetan, and uh, I'm from Arizona. Uh, so <laughs> show the love. Uh, but anyway, so my question is, um, so what are the roles of uh, common goods? 
such as roads um, and things, say, built by the government, and how can individuals uh, supplement the need or at least the perceived need for government to establish these kind of, uh, kinds of things for infrastructure? Well, I mean, I don't consider them common goods. This is, this is property that has been uh, built uh, by confiscating people's wealth by government, right? And it, that's wrong, right? So these could easily all be private goods, and they, in a sense, the only way the government could build them is how, right? I mean, people say, people, I, I, Obama accused, uh, says about wealthy people, he says, you know, you owe society something because you, you drove on the roads to get to work. Well, who pays for those roads? Well, we do. Yeah, I mean, but we, who in particular pays for those roads? The individual. Yeah, but which individuals in particular pay for those roads? Taxpayers. Yeah, I get, my guess is this room is not, there are not a lot of people who pay for those roads. There are a few of us in this room who pay a lot of money for those roads, right? And they're the ones Obama's going after, right? What comes first, roads or business? What comes first, roads or business? I mean, government roads in the sense that we know them today. Business. You have to have people making money so you can steal from them in order to build the roads. So business and the wealthy people pay for the roads, right? So, so the, all, all the things that people talk about, education, science, roads, are all things that are created by private individuals. The money's created by private individuals, and the work is done by private individuals. And the government has stuck itself in the middle to take from some and, and, and decide how to plan out the space. And it's, it's just unnecessary for the government to do that. Indeed, it's bad and wrong for the government to do that. So almost, I mean, all the cases of public goods, as, as, as economists often talk about it, are just goods that should be private and indeed are, in a sense, private. Because again, wealth is created by private people. Work is done by private people. The government is just redistributing wealth and planning and controlling and manipulating. Thank you. Good evening. Here. Ah, there you go. Hey. <laughs> uh, first, thank you for the lecture. My name is Pedro, I'm from Brazil. Uh, I love Brazil. Yeah, it's a great country. It is a great now country. Now it's getting better, right? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my question is, um, do you think that free will is, uh, is the only factor that influence in someone's life? Or you think that in, cer uh, in certain circumstances, free will is not enough to make an individual get out of a condition of poverty and make it, his life better? No, clearly it's not the only thing that influences a person's life, right? So for example, in Brazil, y you, know, you have, a, you have a, an economy that is often so controlled and so corrupt mm -hmm. that you might be the best person in the world and you might have the best ideas and do all the right things and the bureaucracy or the autocrats will crush you and they will keep you poor and they will not let you exercise your free will. Your, so particularly when there's no freedom, then suddenly it's not just up to you. And this is why, why should we care about politics? I mean, if it really, really you could do whatever you wanted, right? If you really could do anything and it was not dependent on what other people did, you, we wouldn't care about politics. The reason we care about politics is, no, they can crush us. They can stop us from doing what we want to do. We could have the best idea, we could, we could apply ourselves, we can work hard, and they can shut you down tomorrow. They could pass a regulation saying, the particular business that you want to go in is wiped out, it's gone. Mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't matter what you thought, it doesn't matter how you trained yourself, how you worked hard, everything you did, they have guns. Right? and they can shut you down. So in that sense, no, of course it's not enough. You have to have freedom. So freedom is a condition, and, and, and why is freedom good? Right? One of the main reasons freedom good is it because it allows you to exercise your free will in the pursuit of the values necessary for your own survival, for your own thriving. Right? So it's, it's, that's why we're pro-freedom. But it's more than that. Look, there's no question that your genes matter. Right? I mean, look at me. I, I use this example often, right? And look at LeBron James. Right? We have different genes. He's built to be a basketball player or an athlete. I am not. Right? So 
our genes are different. Now, is it enough that he's got the genes? No. I mean, LeBron James works unbelievably hard, and he, is a, he thinks about the game, and he thinks about how to play it and how to train himself and how to get in the best physical shape possible. Those are all choices he's made, and he's had to, he's had to give up certain values in order to achieve this value of, of being the best basketball player in the world, right? Sorry, Steph Curry, right? But <laughs> so genes matter. I, you could train me all you want, and I'm not going to be the best basketball player in the world. It just ain't happening, right? And your environment happens. There's no question that if you were born uh, poor with abusive parents and a bad school system, it's going to be harder for you to achieve whatever you achieve in life. It's going to be tougher. You're going to be, have to be stronger in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is that it's still you. It's so you have to make those choices. But to assume that the external environment has no impact on us or that our genes have no impact on us would be wrong. Mm -hmm. But the determining factor of who you are and what you are is you. I mean, put aside truly abusive and, and real force or genes that just, you know, if you're born with an IQ of 50, I mean, it's just a reality. There's only so much you'll be able to ever achieve, right? But assuming freedom and assuming normalcy, I mean, if, if your parents lock you up in a closet for 12 years, I don't think free will matters. So you're probably mm -hmm. screwed up forever, right? Okay. So all these things play into it, mm -hmm. but, that doesn't, but that just elevates the importance of free will because all these are conditions, and then what do you do with them? And thank you for answering this question. And as about a second thought, um, do you think that we can make an analogy between this ideology and thought of Ayn Rand and Machia Machiavelli with Virtu and Fort Fortuna is just something that occurred to me when you were speaking, because yeah. I... I bet you have already read The Prince. So when he, he, she is saying about virtue and fortuna, you think that free will can be like you playing with the, the environment surrounding you and taking advantages of it? I don't think so, but no. I don't think so. But I don't, I don't want to say more than that because I, 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 I read it a long time ago. Mm. And we can discuss more. I the suspect that it's not mm -hmm. in a very deep and important sense, but I, I don't want to speculating on why that is. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Luis from Guatemala. Um, my question is, um, yeah, um, so when you talk about rights, right, um, I immediately thought about slaves and do these people actually have Right. Oh, I mean, they lived entire lives without right to, you know, free will, right to a property or whatever. Is there such a thing as rights if there isn't a bigger power there to grant them to you? No, rights are not granted. You have rights as a human being from, from the sense of the moment you're born, you have the right to life. You have a right to pursue those values necessary for your own survival. You have a right to act for your own flourishing, for your own success as a human being. You have a right to pursue those rational values. Now, in the case of slavery, those rights are being denied from you. Those, you know, people are, 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 are oppressing you, are, are denying you that freedom. That's the, you know, and this is what, why, one of the reasons, the reason we establish government mm -hmm. is not to give us those rights, but to secure those rights. That is to protect us from oppressors, right? This is why slavery is such a travesty in the context, I mean, it's a travesty in any context, but in the context of the American Revolution, it's a huge, you know, the travesty is that here we are declaring the rights of man, right? The inalienable rights of man, and yet allowing the institution of slavery to exist at the same time, which contradicts the idea of the role of government as securing those rights. So no. Every human being on the planet, whether they know it or whether their government knows it or whether they have rights, now it's just a question of do they have a government that secures those rights or do they have a government that 
violates those rights. In the, name of, in the case of slavery, our government violated those rights. They violated by allowing slave owners to own slaves. And of course, the slave owners violated rights. Um, yeah, no, thank you. But then what do the rights mean to any individual being that there's not a stronger power there to protect them from something It means else? it's something to, for them, it means something mm -hmm. to strive towards. It means to fight for their own freedom. It means that their lives is theirs. It's not their own, there's no owners, right? It's not the states, it's not the dictators, it's not the slave owners. Their life is theirs and they need to fight for that life, right? Mm. But because, because your rights are being denied you doesn't mean you don't have them. Then it's a recognition that you have them that gives you the spirit to fight the oppressors. Because otherwise, if we don't have rights, right, if, we only, if they're only granted to us, then as long as they're not granted to us, then by what, by what right do we demand our freedom? Why not just stay slaves? Yeah. No, it's our, my life is mine. You don't, you don't get to tell me what to do, and you don't, you, you don't get to whip me when you feel like it. It's my life. I have a right to live it as I see fit. Right? And so I think it's, it's, it's that... It gives them that spirit of rebellion, I guess, I, I guess would be the case. When they identify it, the problem in so many places around the world is that people don't identify that they have rights. They don't recognize that they have rights, and they submit. In too many places around the world, people submit not to slavery, although that exists as well, but to, to oppression. So people don't rise up against dictators. People don't rise up against religions that oppress them or... Uh, ideas that oppress them or, 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 or uh, theocrats or dictators that are oppressing them. They accept the fact that, you know, their life belongs to the state, their life belongs to the dictator, their right belongs to the class or, you know, tribe or whatever. So it's a huge achievement, a huge achievement to recognize that you have rights, to identify that. And the philosophers who first identified it that's a huge achievement and a huge benefit to all of us. And then, but each one of us has to recognize, again, free will, right? We have to recognize in our own lives that we have a right to our own life. That's an achievement which many, many people, I'd say most people on the planet, have not achieved. So you remember Bush said, uh, George Bush at some point said that all men yearn for freedom or something. He made some statement like that. We all have freedom in our hearts. It's not true. I wish it was, because it's not, an, it's not in our hearts. It's in our reason. We have to reason to freedom. It's not an emotion, and a lot of people don't have that emotion. A lot of people are quite happy to just follow orders and just, because they haven't achieved the recognition that they have the right to their own life. Again, it's a huge achievement historically. I mean, remember, this, the, the idea of a right to life is something that was recognized, what? three, four hundred years ago in the history of a hundred thousand years of the human race. So it's, it's new and it's an, a, a tremendous philosophical achievement. Thank you. There was somebody here. Yeah. Uh, one of the, uh, I'm Josh, I'm from Oregon. Uh, one of the big issues in the West recently that I've noticed is that some copyright laws can be ridiculously long, granting rights to an idea decades past the author's death. Uh, can, can you kind of talk about you know, the extent to which that right should exist? I mean, you guys are pushing the limits of my knowledge. Um, there's no question in my mind that copyright laws should exist. And uh, that you have a right not to have your work just copied when you publish it and produce it and, and anybody can then benefit from the work that you have put into it. Whether they should be 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, how long after an author's death, all of those technical questions beyond my pay grade. Talk to Adam Mossoff uh, at George Mason. But the point is that there needs to be a period in which you can benefit from the creative work that you have put in. And how we determine that exactly, I'll leave that to philosophers of law. That's their, their job to do that calculation. I suspect that right now it's too long. 75 years, I can't remember, after death or something, strikes me as too long. 
But I don't know what the right number is. And, and again, I would leave it to philosophers of law. Right, thank you. But Ayn Rand's a big proponent of copyright and patents uh, and intellectual property rights more broadly. Uh, can you lend any insight on connecting um, America's perspective on free will and America's attitude, or I should say, um, millennials' attitude towards the election this year? <laughs> so Americans' attitude towards free will and the millennials. I mean, what is, I don't even know what the millennials' attitude towards this election is. How many millennials are actually going to vote? I assume they're mostly going to vote for Hillary, but I don't know that that many are going to vote. Um, look, I think that this is a generation, your generation, uh, that has been raised under, the, uh, un under a f collectivistic, um, anti-individualistic uh, philosophical framework. And it, you know, this is what we're seeing. This is the, the appeal of Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is basically reflecting back to you guys everything your teachers have been telling you for the last 12 years in one form or another. Uh, you need to be taken care of. Why? Well, because you can't take care of yourself. Why can't you take care of yourself? Because, partially, because you don't really have free will, right? You can't really control your own life. You don't really know the world out there. So you have to be taken care of. We don't... and. You know, so it's altruism and collectivism dominate the thinking of your teachers. And therefore, again, Bernie Sanders and to some extent Hillary Clinton, if she ever talks about ideas at all, just reflect back to you what you've actually, you know, been taught all these years. And yes, there's a, there's a decline in, there's no question there's a decline in America in the idea and the belief in individualism, in the idea that, um, you know, that, that existed 100 years ago, 120, 150 years ago in a, in a big way, that you, know, you, can, you can shape your own life. You can start a new, you can go into this new country, and you can make of it, of your life, what you want to make of it. There was this, you know, some, sometimes called rugged individualism, but more fundamentally, it's, a, it's the idea that your life is yours to shape by your own will. Right? And through your own actions. And, you know, that is, a, that is what America used to be. And that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I, I know so many millennials who, who think that, um, you know, what they really want to do is, is, is about, uh, what is it, social entrepreneurship. Or I don't even know what that means. But, right, it's, it's the idea that we have to work for the group. We have to work for the collective. We have to, you know, even if it's voluntary. But the, the whole focus is on other people. Instead of shaping their own souls, instead of shaping who they are as human beings, they're worried about, you know, what's going on out there and how do I deal with other people. They're so second-handed in that sense. Everything's about other people. And I, I think that this generation has a lot of that. Now, how much of it, I, you know, I don't know. You guys know your generation better than I do. Um, I just worry about you guys. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I think it's very much that individualism is missing, and I think part of that individualism is you've been told that it's your, it's your peer group that, help, that shapes you. It's, it's uh, you know, you got lucky because you got good genes, and therefore you're privileged, and therefore you owe people who didn't get good genes because they're not privileged. I mean, the whole language is a language of it's not about you. It's about all the other ways in which you were shaped by external forces that are outside of your control. I think the whole idea of privilege is the idea that you didn't build it, right? That you got it from the outside, whether through your parents or whether through your genetic makeup. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. I think I answered the question. Hello. Hi. Hi. So I have a question about like uh, compatibilism. So uh, what can you say about like compatibilist claims that you know free will and determinism? are like compatible with one another because here's like their main argument is that you know man can really freely makes choices but here's the thing that that those choices are conditioned by their moral nature like you know our hearts and mind like yes they have choices but then are those choices already like given to them that they have preference over those choices so that means that technically determinism free will exists with one another so like or are you 
like clearly rejecting the possibility of determinism and just free will exist. This is why I didn't go study philosophy. <laughs> Anybody tell me what you, yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't get these discussions, but no, <laughs> economics and finance is so much easier. Um, <laughs> where do we get our moral assumptions, right? I mean, this assumes that we somehow have morality imprinted in us, and that shapes what we decide, but how do we get morality? We get morality by making choices. We shape our own morality, our own moral character, by the choices that we make. Now, the fundamental choices that some people make is not to think. What happens to you if you don't think? If you make the choice not to think, then who shapes you? Others. Then it's true. So if I'm not thinking, if I'm not engaged, if I'm not focused on reality, if I'm not making choices, then by default, I'm just drifting, and then I get shaped by other people, by circumstances, by events. But if I'm engaged, if I'm in control of my own consciousness, if I'm in control of my own reason, if I'm engaged with the world out there, if I'm thinking, then I'm shaping my morality, I'm shaping the choices, and I'm shaping my character and my own soul. Does that make sense? But you do observe people, you look at people and you go, there's no free will there. <laughs> because they're just adrift. They're not making any choices. They're just doing what's expected, what they were told, what their mother said, right? They're not actually turning it on. They're not engaged, they're not focused, they're not in focus. Because like, I'm, I'm like thinking about like, because there's this thing about called cultural relativism, like, you know, like being like absolute and like relative truth. Like, I'm thinking of like moral, moral things in general as something like as a matter of perspectives. So you can't like really just say that you know you, you chose to be a good person just because you chose to. There's like outside factors that affects your choice that, that makes you a moral being. Like no. you're not born good or bad or something that like that. That is true, but what you They're choose, and it's not that you choose to be a moral person or you choose to be a good person. You choose the values you want to pursue. And it, you know, and you choose what you view as the good. Those are choices that you make. And yes, you're influenced by other factors, but you get to choose whether you're going to, you know, steal or not, you know, pick up the loaf of bread or not. And even then, are you not stealing because you're not thinking, and some, you remember there's a 10th commandment, not 10, what number is it? I don't remember what number it is. That shall not steal. <laughs> And therefore, you're not stealing, right? And then it's not really you choosing. It's just drifting. And you're being, you, you, you know, you're being guided by some commandment. You've got stuck in there, right? And it's a default because you're refusing to think. You're refusing to engage, right? So that's the, the fundamental choice, as you'll hear tomorrow, is to think or not to think. And if you're not thinking, then, yeah, you're shaped by all kinds of stuff. And you're not in control. That's the thing about people who don't think. They're really not in control. Other forces are in control of them. Religion, tradition, and people all around them. Okay, but don't ask me technical questions at 9.30 oh, at night. Mr. And we'll Mr. make Bro these the last questions. Mr. Brooke, I, I just wanted to oh, uh, uh, yeah. give a response real fast on, on that. There's actually four different types of uh, um, uh, parts of this uh, question that she asked. I just wanted to make a clarification that there's hard determinism, soft determinism, as well as free will, and also what you call libertarianism. Not libertarianism as in the political aspect, but actually of, uh, as far as uh, uh, what your free will is uh, mixed with, uh, the determinism, uh, with the determinism. So um, yeah, highly recommend looking into that. Also, if you were looking in more into natural law, I highly recommend you look into Hugo Grotus, also of Pufendorf. So. Yes, Gr Grotus and Pufendorf are great achievers of the idea, and, and they, they, they originators, some of the originators of the idea of individual rights. But Ayn Rand's perspective on individual rights is different than theirs, because they ultimately are intrinsicists, as I understand it, and she has an objective view of individual rights, which is different than Locke and Pufendorf and um, Grotius. Grotius. Uh, yes. You mentioned Warren Buffett in your speech. Yeah. And the ability to have good sense for capital allocation is really rewarded in today's time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of other skills aren't rewarded as much. And the, the nature of the economy is changing so much to where manufacturing jobs, uh, jobs with low skill, there's not as much demand uh, for those type of jobs. What kind of policy solution is there uh, since the economy is changing so much that can 
give opportunities to people that no, don't necessarily have those kind of skills that Warren Buffett has, uh, so that we can still have a consumer that can you know can still buy products and sure. support I mean, themselves. I mean, this has nothing to do with the economy changing a lot. Look, the economy changed much more 200 years ago. Uh, when we went from basically being farmers who sowed seeds and, and, and that's all we knew how to do. We knew how to farm. And that's, we had no excess. We, we basically grew the stuff that we ate. And suddenly an industrial revolution comes around. That is a much bigger change in terms of real people's lives than what we're experiencing today. And all we need, in my view, is freedom. All we need is to be, is to be left alone. What we need is for the government to stop trying to control the economy and to control the path of economic growth moving forward. So this is, so there's nothing that needs to be done other than individuals taking responsibility on their own life and to figure out what they want to do in their life given what the opportunity set that exists out there in terms of the kind of professions that are going to exist moving forward. But there's no doubt, there's, you know, I, I don't buy any of these arguments that there's going to be there are going to be no jobs, that computers are going to do everything, that we're just going to lay around all day and do nothing. I think that's all nonsense. It's stuff I've heard every decade for, I haven't heard it personally every decade for the last 200 years, but it's been said every decade for the last 200 years. Luddites have always existed who hated technology because it was to destroy jobs. It's always been the case. And today you have more sophisticated Luddites who talk about AI and talk about robots and computers and they use big words, but it's the same the same thing, the same argument. Um, the work week will probably shrink. We'll have to work less to be able to consume the same amount uh, for some, some people. Some people still work long hours. Um, and there'll be many jobs that we can't imagine. And just like 200 years ago, nobody could have believed there were jobs like waiter, hotels didn't really exist, restaurants didn't exist, vacation was not a term anybody could use because nobody went on vacations. So there's a whole industry called leisure that was created in the last 100 years that didn't exist before that. And millions of people work in this, these industries. And, you know, that's, and, and there's so many other industries that just are going to come up because we're wealthier and because technology creates opportunities. Good evening. I am Gustavo, and shout out to my South American fellows that came up here before me. I am All from right. Colombia. All right. From uh, Colombia. Where in Colombia? Uh, the Cartago Valle. Okay, I have That's no idea where that is. Yeah, I figured. Um, so my question is, I'm having trouble understanding the connect be between human nature and objectivism. And what I mean by that is, it seems to me that human nature is very collective. I mean, we are all here gathered today to learn. Um, you know, we are all gathered in communities and cities. We're not living in the forest. I know some people are, but even if they are, I'm sure they have a friend or two. Um, I hope. You know, uh, for you experimental psychologists out there, you know, we look at um, kind of sad events like uh, Jeannie, who was left in isolation for for a decade and came out like a prune. She couldn't talk. I mean, I know that's socialization, yep. all yep. this, but it seems yep. to me that nature at the, at the core is a collective thing where we come together and we help each other. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of having the disconnect between yeah, objectivism so I, so and So I don't nature. think at the core, it's us coming together is at the core of what makes us human or at the core of our nature. There is an enormous advantage of coming together, and this is why we do it, because we benefit enormously from one another as traders, so as providers of value for value, not as just lumps in a room. I know lots of people I do not want to be with tonight. <laughs> I mean, probably millions and millions of people I do not want to be with tonight. I want to be with you guys. Why? Because I hope that you guys will generate value that I will benefit from, right? And I hope that I'm generating some value to you. So what makes us come together is a value proposition, a win-win situation in which we're producing value for one another. That value could be spiritual, it could be material, but it's value. And living in civilization, you get layers and layers and layers of this because you get to benefit from all the knowledge that has accumulated in the past and you get all the knowledge that people have today, all the values that they're creating today. And then there's the emotional value that we create, love, right? That, that is created between 
some people, not, not everybody, again, right? right? But we're very selective about these things. Again, there are a lot of people I do not want to hang out with. Right? So it's not this sensual nature wanting to hang out with people. We want to hang out with people because people provide us with value. Now, why do they provide us with value? And where does the value that we can provide them come from? And that's what's human nature. That's what's essentially human. And what's essentially human is our reasoning capabilities, is our ability to reason, it's our ability to think, it's our ability to create, to produce, to make stuff, to, 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 to paint beautiful paintings, to, to do beautiful sculptures, and to, you know, I always do this, and to build an iPhone, right? And then we trade. So it's that, it's the fact that as each individual, we can think, we can reason, and we can create and produce that makes a bunch of us group together an enormous value. But it starts, you know, we don't have a collective stomach. We, we don't collectively eat. We eat as individuals. We don't collectively think. We can help each other think just like we help each other eat by somebody. I, I didn't actually kill the chicken I ate today. Right? Right. So that is what is the incredible benefit we get from living in society, living in civilization. It's not impossible to live in your own. It's just not fun. Right. It's, 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 it's a disaster, right? Given, given the alternative, given what's possible. Right? All right, let's do these last, uh, these three are gonna be the last ones, uh, or two. I think it's the last one. Last one, okay. All right, I'm Josh, I'm from Atlanta. Um, you and I were talking outside a little bit about size of government and how that's concerning. Um, my question's related to that and free will. So I agree that in our history as a country, the declaration of the rights of man and the individual are very important. But it seems like that has moved throughout our history from being a country where we allow people to be individuals and to exercise rights on their own, to where if our current government is any reflection where freedom and decision to choose has resulted in a larger government, more interference in our individual lives. And I guess my question is, you know, in view of that, you look at the end of Atlas Shrugged where they're writing amendments to the Constitution in Galt's Gulch and talking about no laws against pri about yeah. private property. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that our current system, you think the current issue is really with our government system, the Constitution, or do you think that this is more a reflection of something that's happened in the electorate and the intellectuals that oh, are forming our I don't our think there's education. any question. This is a, government is an outcome. Government is the end. Mm. It's never a cause, right? We get the government we deserve as a culture. We mm. get the government we deserve. We get the politicians we deserve. We deserve Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. This is the state of the culture. We have an unthinking populace. We have a populace that is not exerting you know, their reason and their free will. We have a populace that is drifting and uh, focused on emotion, not on thought. And this is what you get. So it's not, it, c politics is the end. This is why I think going into politics, getting excited about politics and really engaging in politics, while we need to care about politics, you know, getting overly excited about politics, you're not gonna change the world through politics. Politics is the last thing to fall. Our populace is shaped by our intellectuals. And when the intellectuals teach, teach over and over again, you didn't build that, you owe society, your life is not yours, you must sacrifice, right? Then, you know, we, we become dependent on government and we vote to get bigger and bigger government. We vote for the corruption, whether we like the particular corrupt. I mean, people don't even care that our politicians are corrupt, right? Because we voted for them. We've accepted the system. This is a system most people want. Now, most people don't really think it through. They just drift into it. This is the issue of free will, right? Mm -hmm. But this is what we've been conditioned to be by our intellectuals. So this is an intellectual philosophical battle. It's not a political one. It doesn't matter who wins this election. It doesn't matter long term who wins. It, it'll matter short term, but it doesn't matter long term. Long term, it's a question of the intellectual state of the culture and where, I, you know, which direction it goes in, in terms of 
in terms of the intellectuals. And we know the intellectuals are corrupt, so you, it's hard to be optimistic about the direction the culture is going to take because you look at the intellectual world in which we live. I don't look at the politicians and say, oh, well, we're doomed because our politicians are corrupt. I look at our intellectuals and I say, we're doomed because look at our intellectuals. And I don't say, well, we need to work really, really hard to do is replace the politicians. No, that'll happen. That'll happen, right? What we need to work really, really hard and what we hope you guys do ultimately is replace our intellectuals. So if we replace the intellectuals, then a generation later, our politicians will be replaced as well. If you replace the politicians, nothing will happen. And you can't replace the politicians because the people don't want the better politicians, right? So it, it, it's, we, we, we like politics because it's, it's immediacy and it's passion and it affects our lives right now, but it, doesn't, it's not where the action really is. The action is on your campuses. The action is your professors. The action are the ideas that are being taught, the ideas that students, millennials are advocating for and the professors are advocating for. It's that intellectual debate that's going on every single day on American campuses about free will, about reason, about altruism, about morality, about all these issues. That's what's gonna change the world. Right? For the better or for the worse. It's not, it's not the politics. The politics is an outcome of one's perception, of one's ideas about these things. If we get wrong ideas about free will, wrong ideas about reason, wrong ideas about, about morality, then it does then <laughs> how, how can you get good politics? You're not going to get good politics. So, you know, the battle is in epistemology and in ethics. It's not in politics. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.